I, I was uh, just preached over at our Kesslinger campus, and I drove perhaps a little faster than I should have through Mill Creek to get here on time. I got to tell you, being here and <laughs> being here and seeing all of you worshiping here is really. Um, I, I <laughs> yeah, I apologize. Some of you are probably like, "Who's this guy? And why is he emotional?" <laughs> Um, it's just so many people have been praying and working for so long to see God do something here, and, and it's happening, and we're a part of it, and we're so grateful for that, and I'm so grateful to be here. As Sterling said, if you don't know me, my name is Jeff Frazier, and I serve as the lead pastor, but we really are a collaborative team there. Many of us, you know, hear from different folks as time goes on. Uh, we want to continue on in our series, which you were a part of hopefully last week, uh, about who Jesus is from the book of Hebrews. I've got a friend who's a pastor, I met him just about a year ago in a, a pastor's uh, cohort I'm a part of in, in, we met out in Las Vegas. I always feel funny saying I went to a pastor's conference in Las Vegas, but I did. Um, and he, he pastors a church there called Canyon Ridge Church, just out between uh, Las Vegas and Henderson, Nevada. And when the unthinkable happened just over a week ago, I texted him. Just said, I just want you to know I'm praying for you and for your church. In, in, in the aftermath of the unspeakable mass shooting. He texted back and thanked me for the prayers and said, keep them coming. And he said, it's amazing, as dark as it is, people were being flooded with people who were looking for hope. Those were his exact words. Just flooded with people who've never met before at all hours of the day, coming to the church looking for hope. I've noticed this is an interesting phenomenon. It happened in, when 9-11 hit. It happens in smaller ways in our lives when we face tragedy or sorrow or just uncertainty. People are looking for hope. You, you can hear it in our culture, can't you, in these kinds of, when we're in this time as a, as, a, as a nation? Even if you pay attention to the late night talk show theologians. Did you know we have those? And listen to the things that they say. Jimmy Fallon, the day after, said, we need to restore hope. The other Jimmy, Kimmel, we cannot give up on hope. Stephen Colbert, we must hold on to hope. And even Ellen said, I want this to be a show full of hope. That sounds nice, but what does it mean exactly? Like we, we, we talk about hope, we know that we need hope. What, what is it though, really? What is hope? This is precisely the question we're going to examine in our uh, text from the book of Hebrews. As uh, If you weren't here last week, if you're brand new, uh, we're in a series called Jesus is Greater from the book of Hebrews. It's a letter of the New Testament written to Jewish Christians. That means they grew up in Judaism, but they converted to faith in Jesus Christ. They're Jesus followers with a Jewish background. And they're living in the first century, and their lives are getting harder and harder because of primarily their faith in Jesus. They're being persecuted for trusting in Jesus. And they're wondering kind of collectively, is it worth it to follow Jesus? Is this worth it? And the writer of Hebrews is saying, absolutely it's worth it. Where else will you go? Jesus is greater than anything you'll face, than anything you'll see, than anyone you could turn to. And we're going to see how he's our greater hope here. If you have your Bible, you can turn with me or it'll be on the screen. Hebrews chapter 6, we'll read the last few verses, verses 13 through 20. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. Now, if you're thinking that God swears, I'll explain that in a minute. <laughs> Saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you, and thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf having become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. That last word, Melchizedek, if you're wondering who Mel is, come back next week, we'll explain him. But for now, this passage is, is really all about hope, and it, one of the first things, it's, it's convoluted a bit when you first read it. It's about Abraham, Old Testament references, but the primary point here is that hope, biblically speaking, is all about who God is and whether or not he's trustworthy to his promises, whether or not you can count on him. 
This is very different, isn't it, than perhaps what we hear in our culture when people talk about hope. I hope this works out. Will the Cubs win the World Series? I hope so. After last night, I don't know. <laughs> right? But it's possible. I know that because last year it happened. So my hope is greater than it was previous. But we're just talking about our desires, our wishes, our outlook on the future based on the past in some nebulous way. This, I want to talk to you about the nature of hope. The nature of hope from the Bible's perspective over against our culture. It's human to hope. We can't help it. We're sort of hardwired for it. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 4 says, To be among the living, he who's joined with the living has hope. Better is a living dog than a dead lion. I think that's funny. Meaning, if you're alive, you hope. It's part of what it means to be human. And with the, begin, the minute you lose hope, you begin to die. If you become hopeless. Um, secular positive psychologist Charles Snyder has developed a theory he calls hope theory. It's a dynamic, cognitive, motivational system. What? The premise is this. Those who are hopeful people tend to realize what they hope for in their life more than those who are not. All right. Does that mean I can wish something to be true? Kind of, he says. And perhaps you've heard of something called optimism bias psychology. Anybody heard of optimism bias? This, is, this transcends cultures and, and, and races and creeds. It's sort of con natural to human condition. Uh, Secular psycholo psychological researchers tell us that if I were to survey all of you in these categories and ask you to rate yourself, are you below average, average, above average, or far above average in these categories? Your ability to get along with people. You above average? Average? Below average? I'm, I'm not talking about your spouse next to you. I'm talking about you rating you. <laughs> right? Or, or how about your intelligence, your sense of humor? Your ability to get along with others. I said that one already. Your appearance. Your level of self-awareness. That's sort of an oxy. That's funny the irony there, right? But if you were to rate yourself on those five areas, statistics, researchers tell us that more than 80% of you would rate yourself as far above average, which is statistically impossible. <laughs> you can't all be better than everyone else, right? <laughs> but we think of ourselves, that's optimism bias. Tali Shero, who, who's coined that phrase, she has written, and you could, there's a famous TED talk of hers about this. She says, the human brain seems hardwired for hope. But is that what hope is? Is hope is just believing the best about yourself and others? That's what our culture says, by and large. The people who are coming to my friend's church in, in Las Vegas, is that what they're looking for? Just, just a little more optimistic outlook on life? There's got to be more to hope than just thinking the best. Good thoughts coming your way. There's got to be more. And optimism is good. It's, 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 I'm not a fairly optimistic person. My wife is, well, she would call herself a realist. I, we disagree about this, but that's another story. It's good to be, have a positive outlook as far as that goes. But I think what the Scripture is telling us, it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't quite go far enough. Indeed, when the Bible talks about hope, it's talking about something much, much more than a positive outlook on life. This, this kind of hope is not something that you muster up from inside yourself. It's not something you generate, that you create. It comes from outside of you. This is why the writer of Hebrews refers to it as an anchor. When we're talking about the anchor of hope. He says, our hope is like an anchor for our soul. In the New Testament... The word hope, is, there's several different Greek words that translated hope. Never do they ever refer to your subjective feelings. They don't refer to your hopefulness. That's what most of us think about, sort of, right? When I say, are you hopeful? I think so. You think about how you are experiencing your present circumstances in life. Are you hopeful or not? But you think about how you feel. That's not at all what the Bible's talking about. When it, when I, if I ask you the question, do you have hope? Most of you are thinking, I think I feel hopeful. But what, what, what the biblical answer to that question is, you have it or you don't. It's an objective reality. It's a concrete, substantive thing. It's a person. That's why he calls it an anchor. I have hope. I may not feel hopeful all the time. My circumstances might make my life feel like it's a boat tossed by the waves, but I have hope. It's an objective reality, not a subjective feeling, according to the Bible. 
In the first two to three centuries A.D., the early church, uh, I mentioned this with, about the Jewish Christians and Hebrews, but in general, the early Christians, the early church, found themselves increasingly persecuted for their faith. First, they're persecuted by Jews. The Jews in the early first century saw Christianity, the Jesus people, as a rogue sect within Judaism. Let's eradicate them. This rumor about the resurrection and these Jesus followers are, are, are causing problems in and around Jerusalem. And then what happened over time is that persecution became Roman persecution, imperial persecution. The Roman emperors, the Caesars, were often looking for scapegoats for things that would go wrong in the empire, for famines and for other things. And very often they chose, wrote different subsets, groups, the Christians. Christians found themselves blamed and persecuted for their faith. And to the degree they had to actually meet in secret, even underground. Perhaps you've heard about the early church meeting in the Roman catacombs. St. Priscilla's catacomb in Rome has over 60 different carvings on the walls, which were secret symbols for the early church. In other words, if you're a Christ follower, you had to be careful about who you talk to openly about that. It cost you your life. You might suffer for it. And so they met in secret, and they would carve symbols on the wall so you would know, oh, this is where the, Christ, the Jesus people are. This is where they meet. You know what the earliest symbols were? One you still see on, it's not a cross. To the ancient people, that was a symbol of torture and, and death. You don't, that's not something you led with. We wear it on our necks now, it's weird. But anyway, the, the, first, the very first symbols were a fish. You see that on cars, right? The, the ichthus, the Greek word for fish is ichthus. It, it's an acronym meaning Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. It was like a code. Oh, I know what does it. Early just followers of Jesus were fishermen. There's a double meaning there. I get it, I'm one of his. And you know what the earliest symbol was? Take a, take a wild guess. Hey, yeah, very good. An anchor. They would carve these anchors. You'll see an image here, a couple of them taken from the, the catacombs of St. Priscilla. These are third and fourth century carvings, but nevertheless, you get the idea. The anchor. It was not a symbol of their shared subjective feelings. It was a symbol that we have the same hope, have hope in a person. We share that. He's the anchor. Now, you might not be aware of this if you're not very nautical like me, but the purpose of an anchor is not actually to decorate your, 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 your beach house or to wear on your tie or your socks. Uh, the anchor was, holds a ship fast. Did you know that? An anchor goes down to the bottom and holds a ship secure in harbor, particularly in a storm. And, and um, years ago when my kids were little, I have two in college and one still in high school now, but when they were little, the three, four, five or whatever the age they were. They were, you know, little kids. We uh, vis vacationed at a friend's lake cottage in Michigan, and we got to use their, their toys, you know, their, all the, their pontoon boat and all this sort of thing, and, and my kids were all excited. Let's take the boat out and go swimming way far out in the middle, Dad. Okay. My wife was on the dock reading, took the kids out, strapped them in their life jackets, toddlers, you know, went out there in the middle of the lake. Let's, let's swim. Took the anchor. It was like a little I don't know, disc thing with it. It looked ridiculous, but I thought it, it's an anchor. It's on the boat. It, it'll work. So I let out some rope, let out some more rope, let out some more rope. I figured that's got to be deep enough. It's a small lake. Tied it off, and we jumped in. Floating around, having a good time. They're, they're climbing on me. We're splashing, you know, and, it's, and they're in their jackets, bobbing up and down, and we're just giggling, having a good time. My wife is on the dock, waving like a crazy person at me. And I'm thinking, she knows I can't hear her. Why is she interrupting our fun? What is she doing over there doing that? She's just waving like this, like this. And I turn around, and you know where the boat was. You get where the story's going. It was uh, 800 yards away in the reeds on the other side of the lake. And I've got three toddlers in their life jackets. And me, with no, I'm, I don't float that well, you know? I do, I do better now, but anyway. So I'm like, ah, what am I going to do, right? I don't know if you know this or not, but the anchor doesn't actually work unless it goes all the way down. If it just dangles in the water, it doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't do anything. It has to go all the way to the bottom of the lake. For you non-nautical types, this is how it works. And it has to grab onto something. This is, what, this is actually what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us. We have this hope. It's an anchor, firm and secure, sure and steadfast, the text says. And then there's this curious phrase where it says, it, it, uh, it goes behind the inner curtain. Did you hear that when I read it? It goes behind the inner curtain. What's that about? It, it doesn't matter. The earliest anchors were, were, were rocks with a ring drilled into them or a, a net full of rocks. It doesn't matter if it doesn't go all the way down. Anchors today can be enormous. I looked up the largest anchor. This is not the actual largest anchor, but you'll see an image of it here. That anchor weighs 50 tons, but the largest anchor weighs 77 tons. I thought, how cool if we could get a giant anchor out in the parking lot, but that was prohibitively expensive. <laughs> it, but even still, it has to go all the way down. So when the writer of Hebrews says, 
it enters behind the curtain. This is an Old Testament reference. Some of you were here last week and you heard the sermon Pastor Sterling gave on the high priest. And it says he's, he's passed through the heavens into the presence of God on our behalf. What the high priest did was go into the Holy of Holies, right? On Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The Holy of Holies was the inner place where God dwelt, the symbolic presence of God, where the Ark of the Covenant was. How many of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? You can't go in there, right? What happens if you go in there? Your face melts, which is not exactly biblical, but <laughs> it's kind of. Like, you can't, you can't go into the presence of God because he's holy and unapproachable. But because of Jesus, your high priest, you ha there has, a way has been made for you to come into the presence of God. So when the writer of Hebrews says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, it's passed behind the inner curtain. In Matthew, chapter 27, verse 51, these are the words about what happened the moment Jesus died on the cross. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks split. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, when he gave up his spirit and said, it is finished, at that moment, the earth shook, the rocks split, and the curtain was torn from top to bottom. And that's not like your drapes, not even like these little curtains back here. It was more than six inches thick fabric. It, it was massive. In an instant, torn from top to bottom. What it was symbolizing what? The way into God's presence has been opened because of Jesus. He has passed all the way in for you. Who's your anchor? Jesus Christ. How deep does he go? All the way. All the way into God's presence. And he must go all the way down to the bottom of your soul for you to have this hope. Not a vague wish. Not a sometimes I, I think about him, but I, he's my anchor. He's gone all the way in for me. And he's gone all the way to the depth of my heart. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us here. It's a rock-solid certainty. It's a hope you can anchor your life to. Because biblical hope is based on God's word, not your wishes. I wish certain things would happen. And when, when terrible things happen in our culture, when tragedy strikes, we want answers. And it's not wrong to debate gun control and mental health uh, legislation. We should talk about these things. These things matter. But ultimately speaking, they're not your hope. You cannot legislate the kind of hope the Bible's talking about. You don't vote for it. You don't put it into office. It's an objective reality of who God is and what he's done in your heart that cannot be undone. This is, by the way, the whole point of the section about Abraham, right? That whole part where he's talking about God's promise to Abraham in, the, in verses 13 through 18. God swears an oath. What? God promises to Abraham, and you can go back to Genesis chapter 12 through 15 and read about this. He promises, I'm going to make you a great nation. Abraham says, okay, but he's old. He's 75 years old and doesn't have any children. And 20 years go by, and Abraham doesn't have a child. And God still says, I'm going to make good of my promise. And Abraham is questioning God's ability to make good on his word. And so God, to help Abraham trust him, swears an oath. Now, in the ancient world, if, you, if I made a promise to you and you doubted my promise, I would swear by something greater than both of us. In Jesus' day, they swore by the temple. You'd swear by something greater than both of us, which is kind of like an ancient contract. Okay, now I know you really mean it, sort of thing, right? But if God makes a promise and you doubt him, who's he going to swear by that's greater than him? Who's greater than God? Class. <laughs> Nobody. So, so God swears by his own word. This is, by the way, in verse 18, it says, so by two unchangeable things through which it's impossible for God to lie. These are the two things, God's word and his oath based on his word. I gave you my word. I'm swearing by that word. Trust it and see if I don't come through. And he did, and he does, and he will. This is, this is, this is the anchor that you can trust God to be good to his word. Human beings, we need guarantees because we make and break promises all the time. But not our God. Titus chapter 1 verse 2 tells us this is the very thing, right? The hope of eternal life which God, who never lies, promised beforehand, before the ages began. These are the two unchangeable things. Our hope is based on God's faithfulness to God's word. And Jesus Christ is God's answer to his promises. All the promises, there's some 7,000 promises God makes to his people, to those who trust him in the Old and New Testaments. All of them ultimately are answered in Jesus Christ. 
The Apostle Paul, when he wrote a letter called 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, actually, chapter 1, verse 20, says essentially this, all the promises of God are, find their yes in him, in Jesus. That's why through him, right, we are constantly utter our amen to God for his glory. All the promises of God to you are, are found, find their yes in Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's yes to his word to you. That's the anchor Hebrews is writing about. It's not a subjective feeling. I hope this works out. I wish. It's I know. Despite how I feel, despite what I'm facing, despite how our world looks, despite the fact that my life feels like a boat tossed by the waves, I know who Jesus is. I know where he's gone for me. I know I can trust him. God's yes to you is Jesus. And that's, by the way, why we are unapologetically all about Jesus around here. We are at Chapel Street Church. I, we, I hope, you, I hope that's, you get that, that we are always all about Jesus. Uh, years ago, a friend uh, uh, that I knew from church asked me if I would pray at a civic event in a different town. I said I would. And then about two days beforehand, I got some instructions in, the, in, in an email asking me if I would not pray in Jesus' name. If I would just pray kind of vaguely, I don't know, to who may concern or whatever, I, I just pray. <laughs> I said, no, I can't do that. Why not? You said you'd pray. I said, I, I don't know any other way to pray. When Christians say, in Jesus' name we pray, amen, that's not like a, a religious way of signing off, like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm signing off now, God. You know? It's the way we're, say, we're acknowledging my access to God the Father is through Jesus Christ. That's how I know you're with me. That's how I know you're for me. That's how I know you hear and answer my prayer. So I, I don't know any other way to pray. How are you going to talk about hope from the Bible's perspective if you don't talk about Jesus? He is the anchor. He is our hope. Optimism, positive thoughts, sending good thoughts your way, that's good, that's not bad as far as it goes. It just doesn't go far enough. It doesn't go all the way in or all the way down. Last, the power of hope. Remember when I told you these Jewish converts to faith in Jesus were facing persecution, right? Their life is hard because they're following Jesus. I, I think it's important that you and I notice something. Nowhere in all the letter of Hebrews, or in all the Bible for that matter, is the hope that's promised ever connected to immediate removal of your suffering. The writer of Hebrews does not say, you trust Jesus, all your problems go away. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, put your hope in Jesus and you won't suffer. You'll be wealthy, you'll be healthy, you won't have problems. That's never promised. The promise made to us, your hope and my hope as a Christ follower, it's not that your circumstances magically improve. They may, they may not. The hope is, I have a God who's with me in the midst of them, even if it doesn't change. And I have an eternal future that's a rock-solid certainty. Most people think hope works like this. Based on past events, I have reason to believe something good might happen in the future, right? Based on what's happened in the past, I hope this will happen. Like, for example, the Cubs. I, I, I have reason to believe that they could win. It's not a, a certainty, but it's better than the Sox chance. They're done playing. Sorry, Dave. Right? <laughs> right? Based on past events in my life, I've seen this treatment work and cure this person. I've seen this happen if someone did this, this, this program. I, I, I have reason to believe that if, because of past events, the future will work out this way. That's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is the rock-solid certainty of your future in Christ runs back into your heart in the present. And that carries you through the storm you're in in the moment. You know, I know that this is a certainty. This is the power of hope. Romans 8, verse 24 to 25. For in this hope we were saved. Into this future hope we're saved. Now hope that is seen is no hope at all. For who hopes for what he already has? My future certainty informs my present reality. My, because of Jesus, my past is redeemed, and my present makes sense, and my future is secure. That's your hope. Not that all your problems go away magically, but that you can trust him in the midst of them. That's an anchor in the midst of a storm. Now, I've heard some people criticize Christians, and I've had this debate with people at times, that 
you know, you Christians, you think about heaven so much, you're not really engaged with what matters right in the here and now. Well, not surprisingly, my good friend and hopefully yours, C.S. Lewis, has something. If you, if you don't know what that, you can ask somebody later. He, he has something to say about this in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, hope is one of the theological virtues. This means that a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not, as some modern people think, a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian man or woman is meant to do, what we must do. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most about the next. I love that. It's because I know who holds the future. It's because I have this anchor that's a certainty in the future that I can work in the present moment now for justice. That we care so much about serving our neighbors. That we want to make a difference in this world because we know the one who holds it and who's going to ultimately restore it. So, so it's not all up to me, right? I'm not trying to grasp onto my 401k or my children's success or my health or whatever else as my hope. That's not my hope. I'm free to give my life away. So my hope is in Christ. That I've got to go in a minute and drive over there and preach this again to the other campus. I want to tell you something before I go. What a shame if you come here week after week or statistically, twice a month for most of you. <laughs> and you sit here, and you hear God's word preached, and you never know this hope. You never know the anchor. With all my heart, I know Pastor Sterling feels the same way. With all our hearts, we want you to know the hope that you can have in Jesus Christ. The absolute certainty of his love. You don't have to wonder how he feels about you, if he likes you, if he's thinking about you, if you can trust him, if you can count on him. Perhaps you feel like your life is a boat at sea. And you're adrift. With all our hearts, we want you to know this anchor. This not subjective feeling of hopefulness, but the object of your hope, Jesus Christ. That's, that's God's yes and his word of love to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to open your word and open our minds and hearts and have you speak words of hope to us. Not wishful thinking, not positivity but the certainty that we can know who you are because of what you've done in Jesus Christ. I, I ask for everybody here this morning, some of us perhaps have just drifted from this and we're placing our hope in the wrong things. And some are here this morning and they just don't know. God, you know each one of our hearts, you know what we need, and I pray that you would be for us the anchor of our souls because you have gone all the way in. May your love go all the way down to the bottom of our hearts. We pray it in your name. Amen.